Well, let's look today at the Word of God, Philippians. Uh, I'm so thankful for Brother Roy Morgan. Last week, Roy filled in for me, and someone said, well, our friends came, and I said, I hope they aren't disappointed this week because the pastor's back. Did you warn them? And the, the warning is, obviously, we're a little bit different. Roy and I have different message delivery styles. So let's get into the Word of God, Philippians chapter 1. I know Brother Roy introduced you to Philippians. Paul's writing from a, a prison. He's actually secured uh, sometimes to the wall and to other soldiers, and he's writing a message, and he's writing a message of encouragement. Now, what would happen to us in America today if we were to write this message ourselves? We would start out with, I cannot believe God has let me do this. I can't believe God's got me locked up. I can't believe God's put me in this prison. I've been serving him faithfully for all these years, and now look what God has done. And that, is that the kind of way we would start this passage if, if we were writing it from our own expression? Because sometimes we, we talk about uh, the snowflake generation. We talk about all these different things. But what's happening really for all of us in America, we've grown comfortable with the gospel. We don't share the gospel anymore like we should because we, we will blame it on, uh, well, no one wants to hear it. Or we'll blame it on not, my church isn't outreaching enough. Or we'll blame it on something. We'll blame something else besides the person in the mirror. And we're responsible for sharing the gospel. Is that true? You and I are responsible. If we're Christians today, if you're not a Christian today, you're not responsible for sharing the gospel. You are responsible for receiving the gospel and accepting Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Then and only then when you receive the Lord Jesus Christ as God wants you in turn, go and preach. Even though we know there are some people who are preaching Jesus because they're trying to make money off the gospel. Even in this very book we're going to see, there were, I guess, televangelists back in Paul's day. I don't know what news they were on, but they were actually preaching Jesus so they could actually make money. They were trying to take an offering from people so they could say, look, I'm a preacher too. It's happening today. Watch what Paul does. He's going to address a letter as you read last week. He addresses the letter to certain people. And let's, look what he's, let's read it together. And I'm going to read, walk over a little bit where uh, Brother Roy preached last week, and then we're going to take off and we're going to finish up in verse 18 today. Verse 1, who's writing the letter? Paul and Timothy, bond servants of Jesus Christ. They are, Paul saying, listen, I'm a slave to Christ. Does that bother you, the word slavery today? We think of civil rights today in America. This is not what he's talking about. This is a bond servant. This is God has called Paul. Paul has surrendered himself to the Lord Jesus Christ. He says, listen, I am a slave of Jesus Christ. Wherever he says to go, I'm going to go. Whatever he says to do, I'm going to do. I'm sold out completely because Paul, I told you, his education was at the max of his time. His wealth was at the max of his time, and, and undoubtedly his family had, had kicked him out of the family. His inheritance was gone because Paul has nothing, because as we read, continue to read, Paul actually comes and has the, he's, pra he's praising this church. He's saying, listen, you sent me a love offering. You sent me a gift, a care package when I was in prison, and I want to write you a letter and tell you, I thank God for you. You ever received a nice letter or a nice care gift from someone? You ever do that? My wife, if, 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 any, if you come by and say good morning to her, she probably is going to send you a card saying thank you. Wendy sends thank you cards. I mean, constantly, we keep the U.S. Postal Service going. I told her, you can send a text message or an email. She goes, it's not the same. And when I was in the military, and it's not the same, when I was overseas, and we'd be floating for 75 days was the longest time we floated. And, and Wendy would actually send a care package, and all my chocolate chip cookies would be crushed to like sand. I remember drinking cookies out of a Ziploc bag going, wow, it tastes just like home. And then I'd open her letters, and she'd spray perfume on her letters. I'd be like, oh, my goodness, what a beautiful smell. With all these nasty sailors I'm around, uh, there was always that sweet-smelling aroma coming off her letters. because, And it was love letters that she'd send to me. Of course, I'd categorize them in my bunk. When you flip the bunk, you can have all the storage. And I would take out my stuff that I, that I really needed, and I'd move it out of the way or throw it away just so I could save those, those love letters because space was, was of, of a premium. You ever been there, done that? You ever had a love letter from someone that really meant something to you? Well, this is what Paul's doing. It's a love letter from God to us, but it's also a love letter from Paul in prison to the church. He's saying, listen, I want to thank you for that, that special uh, care package you sent me. And it was a care package of goods and of resources. He's going to tell us what was in the care package. Watch, let's keep going. We won't get into all of it today, but we'll see some of it. He says, listen, I'm writing this letter to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are in Philippi with the, with the bishops and the deacons. This is for pastors and the deacons of the church, but also it's for everyone there. Now, saints. What do we think about saints today? That's been so convoluted in our society. Many times in the Roman Catholic Church, the Roman Catholic Church is we have the patron saints. We have all these different saints that, we, that you buy from the Catholic shop to actually put in your car. St. Christopher, he does certain things. There's all these different saints that do certain things. 
I got to tell you, listen, that's not biblical. That's not from the Bible. If you have a Catholic background, I don't mean to, I'm not trying to insult you. I'm just saying, if you have a Catholic, a Catholic background, Catholic, we say that sometimes, joking around when I, we have a Catholic background, there's two things you need to remember as well. Because somebody says, are you from the Catholic Church? The answer is, small Catholic, yes. The Catholic Church universal means universal church, by the way. So we are part of the Catholic Church, the universal church. Does everybody understand that word? Different word. I'm talking about the Roman Catholic Church. We're not part of the Roman Catholic Church at all. And they'll sell you, we, in Spartanburg, we used to have a, the Catholic shop was at the, the right at the parking lot with the Baptist Church. Catholic shop was right there. You go in there, you can actually buy all kinds of different statues of saints for your yard. You could buy them for your car, your defrost, uh, uh, sit on your dash. or You could, different, you could buy necklaces. You could buy different things for your home, for your business. You could buy all these different saints. And so the question is, who are, who are the saints? And then you come to the place and you find positionally, listen, we have become, when you give your heart, and your life to the Lord Jesus Christ, positionally, you are a saint of God. That's why Paul's writing, watch, if it was statues, is what he meant, he would say this, to all the statues that are dedicated to Christ Jesus. Is that what he says? No, he's talking to people, he's talking to real people that are living, not somebody who has died and done good deeds in their life. These are people who are alive while he's writing the letter. To all the saints who are in Philippi with the bishops and deacons, he's talking to very specific people, and even today he's talking to us. We are the saints of the living God positionally because of what Christ Jesus has done for you and done for me if we've received him as our Lord and Savior. There is no need to pray to a dead person. Listen, our Savior is alive. We just sang words to the Lord Jesus Christ. He's alive today and forevermore. Is that true? If it's true that he died for our sins, that he was buried, he rose again, listen, it's true then, 2,000 years ago. It's true today. Is that true? Wow, that should have been big. Amen. Would y'all wake up this morning and listen to this? And if it was true that he died for our sins, that he was buried and rose again, if that was true 2,000 years ago, is that true today? Yes or no? Yeah. Amen. Yes, it is. Come, Lord Jesus, come. All the different things you want to add in there, that's absolutely affirmative that the Lord Jesus Christ is alive today. We do not pray. We do not preach about. We don't teach about. We don't sing to a dead saint or dead God. We serve a holy living God today. His word is alive. It's a double-edged sword. The Bible says, listen, he's found in these scriptures. And we know today that he is alive today and forevermore. Furthermore, when he did die, the Bible says in Hebrews 13, 8, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. Is that true? That's telling us that he is God. The Bible says in John 3, 16, for whoever, listen, for, listen, all, right? Catch it? Whoever, all, who call in the name of the Lord, what's going to happen? Watch. For God so loved the entire world. He gathered the world, didn't he, in that message when we told the kids, right? Say it with me. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, or one and only, depends on your translation, that whosoever, that's in the world, that's people, believes on him shall not perish but have everlasting life. Do you know that's a direct quote from God himself? Jesus Christ himself said that in John 3.16. After he told Nicodemus in John 3, 3, you must be born again, Nicodemus. Your mama gave birth to you the first time. I'm telling you the Spirit of God has to give birth to you the second time. You must be born again. You must leave your sinful nature, your carnal nature, your secular nature, and you must be born again to a spiritual nature. And only the Holy Spirit of God can do that through the blood of Jesus Christ. You say, that sounds foreign to me. It sounded foreign to me till, too, till the Holy Spirit convicted me, and I received it with spiritual ears and accepted Jesus Christ. Preachers sound foolish, right, until you hear what they're having to say from the Word of God, that's the Word of God, and you say amen because the Spirit of God confirms the Word of God about the Son of God. Is that true? 100% of the time. Well, let's watch what Paul says. He says, brothers, this is grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. He's going to transition now in verse 3 to a thank you. I thank my God upon every remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine, making a request for you with all joy, all with joy. For your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now, being confident of this very thing, that he, that's the Lord Jesus Christ, our God, who has begun a good work in you, will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. Paul says, listen, I know that God's completing something in you if you belong to him. Now, what is the completion process? Some of you are still in the process. You're not complete. Some of us are still in the process. God's each day is chipping off something off us to make us more and more like Jesus. He's 
honing us. He's making us more mature. Every day we learn something or we say something, we ask, ask forgiveness. We have to mature in our faith. He's saying here he wants us to become complete. We're going to focus on that complete, completeness in just a moment. Can we read verse 7? Just as it is right for me to think of this of, of you all, because I have you in my heart, inasmuch as both in my chains, because I'm in prison, and the defense and confirmation of the gospel, you are all partakers with me of grace. For God is my witness. Wouldn't you have a, is that a better witness to have? Can God lie? God can't tell, he can't tell a lie. And he's Paul's witness. Paul's calling him in the witness. For God is my witness, how greatly I long for you all with the affection of Jesus Christ. Can you love somebody with the affection that Jesus loved with? Only through Jesus Christ can you. Yes, you can. Today, we don't understand love because we don't share love much anymore. We don't even share. We build fences around our houses, right? The city of Aiken has to tell people who live in the city, don't build your fences beyond the front of your house. Did y'all know that? That's an ordinance. Why do they have to tell people, don't build a fence around the front of your house? One, it's for aesthetics. But two, what would happen to everybody just about if they had the chance? We build perimeters, right? We build our own little compound, and we, we want to open up the doors, go in, shut the garage door really quick, and hopefully no one sees me so I can actually come into my property. You don't bother me, and I don't bother you. You think of the white picket fence, and I think I saw it on Andy Griffith's show sometime, and somebody said, is the white picket fence that used to have the spikes on it? I always thought it was beautiful until I saw it. Was that to actually keep people in or to keep people out? And the answer is yes, right? To keep you off of it. And look at the fences. When you drive home today, I want you to look at the fences, how we are doing society anymore. We're closed garages, right? Build enough garages for the cars, close them down so no one can come in unless I let you in. And even now, we even put cameras on our front door. When you ring the doorbell, I'm looking to see, is it somebody I want to talk to? If I don't want to talk to you, I'm going to keep you far away from me, right? It used to be a little peephole, we called it, and now we have a camera system. And even that, we can actually put cameras all around the house. We can see you coming before you get in the neighborhood, right? Or we can 360 you if you're a friend, right, or a kid. I don't want to see my kid. I'm going to leave home. There's apps for everything today. We're doing more and more to push people away than bring people in. Even at church, what is the one that my kids absolutely loved it when they were little, the best thing to do at church, y'all know the very best thing, no matter what Sunday it is, the best thing to do at church, it wasn't singing for my kids. It wasn't praying for my children. I mean, they love that, those things. Do you know what their number one thing was? The Sundays, no, not even God. They loved this more than God. They loved eating at church every Sunday. Whenever there was a the time to eat, they were so excited they were going to taste Miss So-and-So's this or, or whoever was cooking this. They were so excited because the food led to Really and truly, it wasn't the food because it was they, their mother's a good cook, their grandmother's a good cooks. What was it really that was they were looking forward to? It was the fellowship, hanging out with their friends. They got to hang out with their friends and talk about everything. They got to talk about the week and they got to be with people of their size. You ever think about your children? If they hang around you a lot, they have to stay with grown ups all the time. And sometimes it's nice to see somebody your size, right? And talk to somebody your size because they relate. Because when kids use their imaginations, many times adults are like, stop talking like that. Stop being so foolish. Stop that nonsense. And other kids their age, they'll get right into it. I was telling one of our students' family that's in here today, oops, I almost fell off. I, the, the child came up and told me this crazy story, just this outlandish, made-up story. It was funny. And so me and me, I just add, added to the story and made it crazier than it was. I just made it really crazy. I took it to a whole nother level. I put it in orbit. And I finished, said, what do you think about that? Well, this student didn't miss a beat, picked up on that same story and added to it even more. I was like, I've been outmatched, right? I've been outmatched by the wisdom of the, of the kid. Because sometimes kids just want to play make-believe. They just want to pretend, right? What happens when we, how many times, you, if you act and pretend it when you're an adult, right? Guys, right? If you, if you take out a sword and say, I am, and you walk downtown with a sword, or you walk downtown with two guns like this. I'm a cowboy, right? Downtown, you want to be a cowboy? No one says anything about a little boy with plastic guns like this walking downtown with a cowboy hat, right? But adult men, if you put a cowboy hat on walk down with two guns like this, there's probably a good chance you're going to get dismissed from the planet. Is that true? They're going to shoot you because, put down the weapons, right? Because it changes when we get older. Paul's trying to say, listen, you guys love each other. I know that you love each other. And I'm telling you, I love you because this is really the first European Eastern European church that Paul has planted, Paul's been a part of, they're stuck here. And listen, you know who's living here in this church? 
of this area. It's retired army guys, if you will. This is where the military would retire from Rome. And who was their leader? Who was Rome's leader? Caesar, right? And so they're dedicated to the leader of their government. And Paul comes and says, there's a new king in town, just so you know. His name's Jesus Christ. Wait a minute, there's pushback. We've swore our allegiance. You know, when I was in the military, I swore my allegiance to, the, to, to defend the Constitution of the United States of America. Is that true? That's what I did. We all swore an oath and we stood up and we, we said we would do this. And so these men have done the same thing. Now they're retired and there's a new guy coming to town. A preacher's coming to town saying, listen, there's a man named Jesus. He died for your sins. He is the king. Wait a minute. King trumps Caesar or whoever else is in charge. So you think there's going to be a pushback? If somebody, if somebody says, listen, there's a new man coming in and he's going to change all of the way America is structured, America is finally going to be a socialist nation. Anybody excited about that? I would defend it with all I can, right? All, all I possibly can. But So what's happening is this, almost a similar thing. Paul's come in and said there's a new freedom. There's a new king. And listen, here's a new way to live. You love one another. You fellowship with one another. And the church at Philippi, the people who got it, get on board and go, I get it. And in turn, they're like, we need to love on Paul. How do we love Paul? We can't go there. They, they choose a church member and send the church member back to Paul to actually give him this love gift, this care gift. Watch what he prays for them, verse 9. And this I pray that your love may do what? Look at your translation. May abound still more and more in knowledge and discernment, that you may approve the things that are excellent, that you may be sincere without offense until the day of Christ, being filled with the fruits of righteousness, which are by Christ Jesus, to the glory and praise of God. Everything Paul's doing is pointing like this. He's pointing to the church, and he says everything that you're doing in love points people to where? To the Lord Jesus Christ. What did Jesus say when a sermon on the mount? He says, listen, let your light so shine before men that they may see what? Your good works. And something happens when they see your good works. It has to happen because it's the word of God. When I do good works for Jesus Christ, every single time that I do good works for Jesus Christ, what has to happen? It brings glory to the Father. Every single time. The Father is glorified when I do good works. You say, well, how do I know? Because the Word of God says so. That's the end of it. Because God's Word says so. So listen, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and bring glory to your Father in heaven. Well, the whole sermon series that we're into right now is called Partners in the Gospel. Think about this with God. If you're in partnership with God in the Gospel of Jesus Christ here at Town Creek Baptist Church, what do you do? How do you actually invest in the partnership? What is your portion of the partnership? If you're a partner in a business, you understand, right? What do you have to put in? We call it skins, right? You got a skin in the game? Put something in. Give me some money. If you, can, if you don't have money, you might be the partner that actually is going to put the sweat equity in. You're going to do the legwork and make, the, make it happen, right? There's different partnerships all over. But we understand if we have a business, there's something tied into that business. I bring this to the business. You bring this to the business. And therefore, we're in partnership together. Well, Paul talks about the partnership of the gospel. If we're in partner with the gospel of Jesus Christ, if we're partners in this, that means we have a part to play. Is that true? Couldn't God just speak things out? God could just speak it and it happens? It could, it could happen that way. But what did God choose to do? This is God. He chose to use a broken vessel like you and a broken vessel like me to get his word out. The problem is the broken vessel is leaking so bad that God can't use us today. And you know why we're leaking? Because we stuffed his blessings in the vessel and it's our cars, and it's our homes, and it's our families, and it's our job, it's our businesses. It's everything that he blessed us with is preoccupying the space for me to receive what he has to say to go and actually share the gospel of Jesus Christ. God forbid, right? God forbid. He says very clearly, listen, we're partners in this ministry thing. We're partners in the gospel, and the gospel does not get out. It is not good news until someone hears it. Is that true? The gospel is awful news. Think about it. It is terrifying news if you and I know that there's only one way to heaven. When Jesus says in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life, no man, woman, boy, or girl comes to heaven except through me. That is horrible news for those who are not in the faith. Is that true? Would you agree? We have that truth. We're sitting on that truth like, an, like a hen sits on an egg, hoping that it's going to hatch. And the only way it's going to hatch is if we actually get out and actually take the word of God and spread it with our mouths. People are not just watching you to see the good works. Yes, that brings glory to God. 
but they need to hear the gospel. Paul says in Romans 1.16, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. It is the power of God unto salvation, first for the Jew and then for the Gentile. We have to actually proclaim. We have to get out and exhort people. We have to come to the place that we say what God says about the word of God. Listen, every man, woman, boy, girl is born a sinner from mother's birth. Until we grow up, we have to come to the place that we receive Jesus Christ as our Lord and our Savior. It's very true, and it's true for us. Watch what Paul says. Listen, he gets into the, the, the Philippians got into the ground floor, if you would. Can you imagine if you bought 10 shares of Google when it was released? What would it be worth today? Facebook, any of the Coca-Cola, just, just pick, pick a stock, a company that's very profitable today, and think about if you just, somebody said, come to you and say, hey, listen, I heard about this new company. You need to buy in now while it's, while it's young. And you're like, ah, it's too good to be true. Some, some are true, but people that jumped on board, what happened? They're multimillionaires, and some probably are billionaires because of what they purchased back in the day. They made an investment on the ground floor opportunity. Here's the good news for us today in the gospel. The ground floor opportunity is always open until Jesus comes. Paul said, listen, this is your partnership in the ministry. This is your partnership in the gospel, God's grace, until he comes. See what he's doing? He's looking forward to the day that he comes again. And Jesus Christ is coming again. He's looking forward to the day. That's his focus. Here's Paul's chance for the Philippians, and really for you and for me, to get on this ground floor opportunity. Number one, I want you to take, if you take notes, look at this real quick. Complete, enjoy, and fellowship. Watch what Paul says, verses 3 through 5. I thank my God every, upon every remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine, making requests for you with all joy for your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now. That's what Paul was focused on, complete in joy and fellowship. It was his joy. When we think about joy, the word joy, we've said it so many times that children understand it. What does it stand for? J-O-I. You can put it in this, this acronym. First, you put Jesus. Second, you put others. And third, you put yourself. Is that the great um, commandment of God, to love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, to love others as you love yourself? Is that joy? Yes, only joy comes from God. It's not happiness. Because you can be happy right now, and if an earthquake comes and destroys your home in the next minute, you'd be sad. True? Happy, sad. That's how we walk through life. Paul's talking about something more than just being happy. He's talking about the joy of the Lord. You ever heard that the joy of the Lord is my strength? Have you ever heard that? Do you know where that comes from? Nehemiah. It comes from Nehemiah. Nehemiah from an Old Testament uh, uh, the builder of the walls of Jer Jerusalem. It comes from Nehemiah. It says, the joy of the Lord is my strength. We quote it today like it's a direct quote from Jesus or somewhere. It's an application of God from the Old Testament, also in the New Testament. Is that true? Paul says, I want your joy to be complete. How is your joy complete? Simply by the word joy. Jesus, others, and then yourself. He said, I want you to be complete in joy and fellowship, number one. Verses 6 to 11, I want you to be complete in good works and love. Now, what are our good works? What comes faith? Work oh, comes first. Faith, works, or works and faith. Which comes first? Always comes faith first. True? You must become a believer. You must be into the faith. You must be born again. Now, can you do good works without being saved? The answer is yes, of course. You can be a nice person, but you're a lost, nice person doing good things headed to hell. Is that true? But once you're born again, listen, you come to the place, you would automatically assume, everybody assumes this if you say that you're a Christian. Everybody in the world thinks this should be true. A Christian should be like Christ. Is that true? But how many Christians are unlike Christ today? They don't care about the church. They don't care about the things of God. They don't care about reading their Bible. They don't care about singing songs. They don't care about praying. It's all about gimme, 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 get, 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 more, more, more. We're just like the world. So what, is, what hope does the world have? If we're just like them, what, what, what hope do they have? What promise do they have? Because people, listen, church, people are looking to you for the hope of eternity. They're hoping that you really have something that you say that you have. But so many times people say, I'm a Christian today, and we know that it's happening all over, especially in worship leadership today. Preachers today, are being, they're stepping down by the droves because they're being shamed by some sin. Worship leaders that are prominent in society are saying, I don't really believe in God anymore. God forbid. There's a really toasty place, listen, in hell, I believe, for men that would lead people astray like that. 
Listen, would God, can God forgive? Yes, absolutely, God forgives. He forgives sin. But these men are stepping up today saying, I don't believe there's a God. These are men who led worship from the pulpit, the people who have stood in the place and trying to bring people from themselves to worship God. And now, now they're coming out, and it's coming out in large numbers. I never really believed. I don't believe there's a God. And they still actually want to use the values of Jesus Christ, but apply them to nothing, just to life. God forbid that we would do that. The world is looking for us to be different. The world is looking for us to be completed in our joy. The world is looking for us to be completed in our fellowship. The world is looking for us to be completed in our good works. Have you ever done something for somebody, even though it was out of your way? You ever picked up a hitchhiker? You ever changed someone's tire on the side of the road? Have you ever paid for someone's meal in the drive through Have you done something just for the glory of God because it made you smile and you said, God, I'm doing this not because I won't be, oh, I hope that person remembers my tag number and tells me thank you. But you do it because you just want them to do a good work. You want to see someone smile and hope that they see. If you have something on your car that says, I love Jesus, that they, they, they would come into an encounter with someone else who loves Jesus. Have you ever done just a good deed for someone? Have you cut someone's grass? Have you come to the place you just said thank you? So many times we were, we were shopping this week at, at, at um, Sam's for our, one of our classes. The kids went on a field trip to shop at Sam's, and we cut around these ladies that were talking. They didn't really move. They should have moved out of the way, but they just stayed talking closely and kind of blocked the way. And our students walked through between them, between them, between them. The first student said, uh, excuse me, and then the last student said, excuse me. And she said, that's so polite, and she said, thank you. And she said, you're the only one that said that. She was listening. She was testing the She knew we were from a Christian school, but her, she was judging us or looking at us based on our uniforms and waiting for somebody to say thank you, someone to say excuse me and thank you. She was just listening, right? And we had more than one student say it, but she only heard one say it. She was listening and she was looking for a thank you. The world's watching, y'all. Listen, if you wear a badge or you wear the name of Jesus Christ, the world's watching to see if you're really real. Now, what's going to happen the next time we go in that she sees us with that same uniform? What's going to happen? She's looking again. Are you really real? Your coworkers, listen, your family's looking to see if you're really real. They are. They're, 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 wanting, they're wanting to hope upon hope that you're right. Because that day and that diagnosis is coming one day, church. Listen, there is no other place to turn except to God. And the only God that some people know is you. You're the only person they know that loves that man named Jesus Christ. You're the only one that smiles whenever there's no hope. You're the only one praying at the, at the meal. You're the only one giving hope to people, saying, listen, I'll pray for you. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take care of my family. I'm going to take my family here. I'm going to do this. You're the only one that seems like you have it together. And listen, if you don't have it together, your joy can't be complete either. We're messed up as a church in the society. Would you agree? The church of Philippi was not a perfect church, but they've come to the place, they were a loving church. They caught this thing called Jesus' love, and they wanted to spread it all around, and they wanted to take care of the Apostle Paul. At least we can do is send a church member with a, with a gift basket to Paul. Let's go help Paul. And in doing so, listen, they actually are spreading the gospel, and everyone that receives this, and when we read into chapter 2 and 3 and 4, when we read ahead, we see they were encouragement to Paul, and how they encouraged Paul but yet we see the gospel also presented coming up shortly. Paul said, listen, this is us working together for the gospel of Jesus Christ. Do you see the whole purpose? Us together under the banner of Jesus Christ working to forward the gospel of Jesus Christ. Every purpose in our life should be this. Our life goal, if you will, is to honor Christ. Bring him glory. Life goal. Put that out if you have write notes. Life goal. Honor Christ. Bring him glory. Here's the, here's the question we have today. Listen, are you like the people of the church of Philippi? Or are you like the church of Laodicea? Laodicea, the Lord Jesus Christ told them, I wish you were hot or cold. Something's going on. you got these two streams of water coming in. And listen, you're lukewarm. Lukewarmness is not where God wants us to be. And he didn't want us to be cold. Somebody said, well, God wants us to either not serve him or he wants us to serve him fully. I've heard that preached. It's not what he's saying. You think God wants you to not serve him? No, he wants us to serve him fully, completely, with joy. I was, I was looking around, we were singing just a minute ago. If you know the song or not, what happens when you sing to God? Jesus, 
We're so sleepy because we stayed up too late last night, right? Or we worked. Some of us didn't have a break. We're not telling him what he's worth. And we can't tell him what he's worth in this place. I'm telling you, the church, we won't tell our friends and neighbors what he's worth. We just won't. We've come accustomed to being accustomed to the culture. We've adjusted ourselves to them. You ever took a thermometer, stuck it in a kid's mouth or under their arm, wherever you put it, right? What does it tell you about that person? Either their normal temperature or they have an elevated temperature, right? Unless you go the other way, unless you get a, you're dying. It tells us that that person is somewhat healthy and within the norms that we understand of normal, or it tells us that something's wrong with that person. If you could take an invisible thermometer today and, and do your spiritual life, if you could stick that in your spiritual thermometer place today, what's your temperature? Is it normal, like Paul says of the church of Philippi? Is it something that actually brings glory to God? Are you sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ? Are you praying for people? Are you loving on people? Are you sharing the gospel? When someone says, I'm having the hardest time in my life, you won't understand. You're right, I don't understand, but I serve the God who does. Are you going to his word at every turn? And this is, this is every minute of every day. This isn't just preacher duty. This is minister of the gospel. That's what we are as Christians. What does your thermometer, your spiritual thermometer say about you? Let's just take that thermometer real quick and let's put it into the thermometer of the church at Philippi. Were they doing, were they doing the work of the Lord Jesus Christ? Yes, we look out and say, this is normal. Love is normal. Joy is normal. Fellowship is normal. Doing good deeds is normal. Sharing the gospel is normal. How do you know when they're sick? Take that same temperature. If you take these, everything that Paul says to do and put do not or put the opposite on it, what's going to happen? That's abnormal. That's the opposite of God. Today, listen, we took out the same thermometer for our spiritual checkups. Where do we land the plane? Are you sick spiritually? Are you unhealthy spiritually? Are you sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ? Well, pastor, I do this or this, or this. If God leads you to do whatever you're doing, God bless you. And if you're checking out healthy, God bless you. This is not a shame time, but I'm saying as a church as a whole, are we checking our temperature on a regular basis saying, am I healthy or not? God, am I healthy or not? Will God tell you if you're healthy? Yes, he will. Did, does God speak with clarity? 100% of the time. Did Moses know the burning bush God was speaking? Did he take his shoes off? Why? Because God told him to take his shoes off. Is that true? Did Joshua know God was speaking to him? How? Because he knew it was God. He understood his voice. Did David know God was speaking to him? Without a doubt. Did Gideon know God was speaking to him? Without a doubt. They didn't like what God said. Most of these men didn't like what God said to do. They didn't like what his message was or what, he, what they were supposed to do because, I mean, they had to get out of their comfort zone. But they knew exactly that God had spoken. They knew exactly what God said to do, and they did it in most cases. Where are we today? Have you heard from God today? Has God told you what to do? You say, well, I don't hear from God. We're reading this in the experience of God, aren't we? You will hear from God if you're in tune with God. He speaks with clarity. He tells you exactly what to do, when to do it, and how to do it. Well, the how-to he doesn't always give you. He just says do it because sometimes it seems impossible. The thing that God's calling you to do, you might say, I, there is no way. I don't have the education. I don't have the financial resources. I don't have fill in the blank. You all make all the excuses you want to. <laughs> I'm telling you, we serve a holy God. When he says to do something, you say, okay, God, here am I. Send me. And when, he, when you're prepared to go, then he starts the equipping or the providing. He starts putting on the spiritualness, the spiritual guiding that you need. He starts bringing people into your life that you need. He starts putting the finances together that you need. He starts bringing the other people into your life that you need. He puts all the things in order because he's a God of order. Hebrews 13, 8, we checked with Jesus Christ, and he has been the same in the past. He is the same today, and he will be the same forevermore. God always speaks with clarity. 
when you come into the partnership with God in the gospel, partnership in the gospel, listen, God has already done his part. Is that true? He has spoken. He has come to the earth to live as a man, a perfect man, without sin. He died on a cross. He was buried. He really was buried. He really was dead. And three days later, the Bible says he, God raised him from the dead. And he's alive forevermore. Is that true? Based on that, do we serve a living king? Absolutely do. Then how shall we live, church, today? God has asked us a big ask. Is that true? This is an impossible task that he's called you two, you two, you two, you two, and you two. He's called us to an impossible task that we cannot do in and of ourselves. And by the way, if you can do it, it's probably not from God. He's called people to do things. Mike read from Hannah's prayer. Go finish reading that prayer in 1 Samuel chapter 2. God did something she was barren and couldn't have a child. God did something only God can do. And in doing that, look what happened out of that life, a dedicated life to Jesus Christ. So here's the challenge for you today. Listen, are you going to partner with God in the gospel, yes or no? Only you can answer that question. Are you going to take the gospel to your neighbors? Are you going to take the gospel to your enemies? Are you going to take the gospel to your family and friends, coworkers? The answer is going to have to be yes or no. Because when you walk out that door, you've already made a decision. You can either come up and say, but God, you don't understand is there ever a dumber statement on the planet than to say that? But God, you don't understand. Have you ever done it? Have. But God, if, if this happens, then this is going to happen. Think from heaven. Switch to God's point of view. Could you imagine? Does he understand our frailties? The Bible says he understands them. But listen, your anxiety, your marriage... Your financial situation, your health, your church life, your Bible study. Start making a list of things that's in your life that causes you good things or bad things. And God's in charge of all of those things. True? True? We're praying this week. We have a prayer box in one of the lockers. We're praying. We are praying for those prayer requests. When people ask for prayer, we pray on the prayer sheet you got. Listen. Of any time in history right now, when we have the most pressure on our lives, what's happening to our lives? They can implode on us and make us feel like the most unworthy person on the planet. Or you can take those situations and say, okay, God, I can't do this. And guess what he's saying? I know. (laughs) I know. You're a human. I'm not. Let me have them. And when he comes in, she says, don't you care? Sometimes she asks me, don't you care? I'm like, yeah, I care. She tells me that... Maybe we're praying for someone. She says, don't you care enough to, I I care enough. What am I doing? I'm going to go to my prayer closet. I'm going to pray for them. Don't I care? The answer is, I care a lot. What can I do? If I get into a discussion with you, I'm going to take you. I told her Bible study class this morning. If you come to me for counseling every single time, I'm going to take you where? To the word of God that elevates the son of God, that father God will be glorified. Do you understand? Every single time, I have nothing to say. If you do it Clint's way, listen, I have, I've jacked some things up in my life. I will mess it up 100% of the time. But if we do it God's way, here we go again, we get what? God's results. That's what Paul's trying to tell the church at Philippi. You are a blessing to me. I love you so much. Keep the fellowship. Keep the joy. Keep on keeping on because, listen, we're doing this thing together. And when I get out of prison, listen, if, right, I can't wait to see you again. Because I want to live on sharing Christ. But if I die, that's even better. I'm going to see him face to face. But it's better for y'all if I stay here is what he said. But whatever, if God chooses me to go, I'm out. If he chooses me to stay, I'm here. And I'm preaching Jesus to everybody I run in contact with. It's a good word, isn't it? That was a good amen right there. Did you hear that? <clears throat> All right. Let's pray together Listen, this morning. God is calling us church to a hard thing. Some of you, he's calling to salvation. He's like, listen, why are you rejecting me another single day? So some of us, he's calling to salvation. Some people, he's calling to commitment. Listen, get right with God. Be that church of love, that church of fellowship. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you so much this morning that you are a God of love, that you are in charge of all things, that we don't have to worry about being in this thing called partnership by ourselves. You have put all the financial resources in our path. You've put everything in front of us. 
And Father, you're waiting for us to connect with you on your level. Father, you always give us a premise and a promise, it seems like. If we would do this, if my people were called by my name, if we do these things, then you come back and you keep your word because you're forever faithful. Father, there's people in our church that are struggling, in the church globally that are struggling with whatever it might be. Lord, we have all of our personal, we have the same issues. It's either family, finances, health or wealth, kids, grandkids, salvation, friends, neighbors, relationships. Father, whatever it is, it seems like it's in our big pot of stew and just boiling over and over, and it seems like we can never catch up. Father, we know that your hand comes in to turn the thermostat. Just turn the temperature right down where it's manageable if we give it to you. Father, help us grow to the next level to give it to you. We're in need of you today, Father. Everybody in this room needs a touch from you in a very special way. Pray that you would open their minds and their hearts and their lives to receiving that special touch. In Jesus' name I pray for this. Amen and amen.